Hello and welcome to Arts Talk. I'm Stephen Bucker. I'm the Dean of the Claire Trevor School of the Arts. We're having a series of interview conversations with, uh, to begin with, chairs and students of the four departments in the School of the Arts, Art, Dance, Drama, and Music. We had a talk with Don Hill, the chair of the Drama Department, and some wonderful graduate students from that department. Today we're going to be having a talk with Molly Lynch, who is the chair of UCI's famed dance department. Um, Molly has an amazing background herself. So again, welcome to Arts Talk. And Molly Lynch, welcome to Arts Talk. Thank you, Stephen. It's great to see you. And um, you, you are a longtime member of the dance department and a, I would say something of, and I mean this in a positive way, something of an institution in Orange County dance. Um, tell listeners and viewers something about your really remarkable and extensive history as a dancer, as an organizer of dance uh, in and beyond the, the department and the university. Um, okay, thank you. Um, well, I, I started as a, a dancer, as a ballet dancer, um, and I danced professionally um, with the Louisville Ballet, and, but got very interested in arts management and how dance companies work and run. So um, I ended up going more into arts management, and I worked for South Coast Repertory Theater for a period of time. Um, and then ended up being the artistic and executive director of Ballet Pacifica, which I did for 16 years before I came to the university. Um, but I brought with me that experience of, you know, running a nonprofit organization and working with dancers and choreographers and artists and collaborations, um, which I think is all very important um, in all of the arts, but um, especially in dance. Um, but I also have to say that I'm, I'm an alumni of UCI. Um, I got my bachelor's and my master's from UC Irvine and was very fortunate to, over the years, as a student and as a faculty member, have been very fortunate to have worked with every single one of the chairs of the dance department, starting uh. with the founding chair, Eugene Loring, and then working with um, Jim Penrod, Mary Corey, Nancy Reuter, uh, Lisa Noggle, Alan Terciano. Um, so I, I've had that experience over the years in different capacities. Um, so I'm um, very honored to be the chair of the department, not something I ever thought that I would have been doing at this point in time, but here I am in this very strange time as well. Um, but I feel like there is sort of a, a history um, of the dance department um, that I believe in and want to help carry forward as as best we possibly can in the, this given situation so it's truly an amazing background thank you for going through that it's um it's a, just incredible what you bring to the department and the department of course is an extremely highly ranked nationally known dance department has been really frankly ever since the founding of UCI back in the 60s when Eugene Loring came to I think found the dance department. Um, it's, it's known for its wide variety of dance forms. You as a ballet dancer obviously are focusing on that um, particular um, style and, and kind of dance, but the dance department does many other kinds of dance. Say something about the variety of things that the dance department actually offers to students. Um, yeah, you know, since the founding, Eugene Loring was quite um, unique in the fact that he really formed this dance department with the idea that it would train dancers in all different styles. And at that point in time, when it was founded in 1965, you really had sort of focus areas. You were a ballet dancer, or you were a modern dancer, or you were a jazz dancer. Um, and he founded it under the idea that it was a three, um, three legged stool, that it, we needed to do ballet, modern and jazz. And everybody in our department is required to do ballet, modern and jazz. And as we'll talk about, and hip hop. Um, so uh, we have all of those various genres that we teach in our program, along with occasionally, uh, you know, tap dance classes or folk dance or 
um, flamenco, that sort of thing. And then we also have the high level of academics um, with kinesiology and injury prevention, dance history courses, critical issues courses, um, music for dancers. Um, and then we do some conditioning courses like Pilates and, and, and then I teach an arts management course as well. Um, so we really um, give our students, I think, a, a very good, broad education in dance in the academic aspects of it, as well as in the practice aspects of it. Um, and I, you know, I always kind of tout our program as being um, so strong because we are basically a conservatory model based on the practice of dance and the performances and the productions but we are housed in a public university, Research One University, so our students get the conservatory model, practice, performances, academics and dance, but they also get the high level education in a public university that we can offer them here at UCI, um, which I think is really quite unique and exciting. And, and I have to say that we have found that about 25% of our dance majors have a second major in another program throughout the university. And they manage wow. their time well and make it through in four years to get their um, double majors going. Wow, 25%, that's really remarkable. We, we sometimes tout the number of dance and music, especially uh, majors who have a second major, but I didn't realize that there were that many, 25% is fantastic. That, that shows the kind of broad interest that you're talking about the students have in, in preparing for multiple possibilities for their life after the university. It's really particularly interesting what you say because the overall theme for the Claire Trevor School of the Arts this year is the arts and well-being. And what you've just said about the, the broad interest and the deep interest of developing so many aspects of student experience is precisely what we mean by both physical well-being, taking care of your health as a dancer, where your body is being subjected to all kinds of stresses really pretty constantly, but also the development of your that big muscle in your head, you know, your brain, both in terms of information, but also in terms of being able to live a really thorough, full, um, aware and awake life. It's a fantastic multiple approach that you take in the dance department. It's really wonderful. Thank you. Um, it's, it's, a, it's, it's virtually unique. This is one of the reasons I'm so delighted that we're talking because the dance department is known for its fantastic performances, but I think less known for developing, as it were, the whole artist, the dancer as a person who participates in, in her life or his life in a, in a really full and thorough way. And so you've been doing that through the course of this really nutty time we're in, back to the famous day, March 17th, when we were essentially told, go home. And of course, the campus initially said, well, the unit that's never going to be able to adapt to this is the School of the Arts, because everything they do has to be face to face. Everything they do is in the studios, et cetera, et cetera. And you've been really a pioneer. You dance and you Molly have really shown that it's possible to adapt almost overnight. Well, in this case, literally overnight to these new conditions that we, of course, as we're entering the fall term are still in. And so I want to give you the opportunity to talk a little bit about how the dance department really fairly counterintuitively has been so successful at adapting to this crazy time. Say some of the things that you've done with regard to this new Zoom world that we're in, in the dance department, including what you yourself have done as a teacher. Well, it was um, relatively fast, as you say. Um, we sort of ended up the, the winter quarter and we had spring break. Wasn't much of a break, um, but we had <laughs> spring break to basically pivot and um, train um, so I think, I don't know how many different training classes that I took over that spring break um, to figure out how to do Canvas, which is the learning platform, um, to, to figure out how to operate Zoom, which I hadn't been doing before either, um, and to get my classes online um, 
remote. Um, we're not completely online, but remote in in terms of using Zoom and and Canvas. Um, it was quite a crash course um, there at spring break. Um, but I, I was really proud of our faculty in the dance department, some who have had much more experience doing online teaching, such as Kelly Sharp with her Dance 3 class and Alan Terciano with his Music for Dance class. Um, but we suddenly were put in a position where we had to teach all of our ballet, modern and jazz classes via Zoom. Um, and so for those of us, we you know learned how to do Zoom invitations and get our students on to our Zoom classes. Um, we figured out how we could have 49 people on our screen so that we could see everybody in class. And I think that um, I had two experiences myself um, in the spring quarter. One was teaching ballet and all different levels of ballet via Zoom. Quite unique when, you know, it's a, a, a area that you really want to have space and time to be able to do but we were all dancing in our four foot square spaces in our bedrooms or our office or our, you know a kitchen hanging onto the kitchen counter that kind of thing um so we we did that and i think what was kind of great about it is that dance is kind of a communal um activity we're used to being in the studio with say 30 students or 30 dancers and we danced together. And so when we did Zoom, we did all of our, um, a lot of our classes synchronous. So we did it at the time that the class would normally be. So we kept on a regular schedule, which I think is important for us at this time too. And we took class together. So we kept that communal feeling, even though we were all in our little Hollywood Square boxes, we still were there together. We actually had our pianist playing music for our classes live. So he also was in his Hollywood square box um, playing for us. And it's challenging because there's some latency, you know, and delay and, and that. But I think it made us all feel more together, that, that we were working together and we were in class together. We were doing combinations together, even if it was in a small space. Um, and, and then we sort of adapted our classes to try and provide some additional kind of conditioning things that we could do um, in a small space to try and keep our bodies working and keeping in good condition as well. Um, so I, I was really proud of our faculty, but I was also really proud of our students because they just jumped right in. They would come to class, you know, with their hair up and their dance clothes on and some people were hanging on to kitchen counters some people were hanging on to backs of chairs um some people had ballet bars that they you know could could do um and they really they came to class every day they were there they were attentive they took class it was really quite phenomenal to um to see that and i think that it it says something about our dance community um, and how we work together and we are a dance family um, in, in essence. Um, the other course that I taught in the spring and would, which would be similar to some of my um, colleagues was more of a seminar course. Um, I teach an arts management course and I had about 29 students in that course and I ran it like I normally do as a seminar with discussion, open discussion, conversations about articles that we would read. I brought in a couple of guest speakers from one from the Sagerstrom Center for the Arts to talk about marketing, one from South Coast Repertory Theater to talk about the development of, of an arts organization. So we had guest speakers and we had conversations about nonprofit organizations and how you structure them and how you um, organize them. And we did that all via Zoom and um, we had good dialogue um, and good conversations. Um, it's a little bit more challenging from an organizational standpoint, you know, where people are sort of raising their hand to try and talk or um, that sort of thing. But, but I felt like it really worked and um, I think that the students felt like they were connected to each other. We had times where we would allow the students to just have conversation about what they were going through or how this, you know, they were adapting to the um, being on Zoom so much and then trying to be sensitive and aware of, of how they were making those adapta adaptations um, as well. So 
Um, it was quite a challenge um, to make that pivot so quickly, but um, things seem to work out pretty well. And, and I think that we're getting prepared for the fall um, as well. It's a really interesting distinction you make between being online and being remote. Um, this is a big discussion going on at the university. An online course is one that is actually taking advantage of all of the technology of the internet and you know computer programming. But the the problem with being online is that it's pre-prepared. What you did in your classes that were remote, that is to say synchronous, another word for happening as you see it, is um, that you actually do have a direct or, you know, a virtually direct interaction with students. There really is a kind of advantage to being virtual because there you are with the students. Must be really remarkable to see 50 students playing simultaneously, give you a sense of vertigo for a second as the, the whole screen begins to bob up and down. But another thing that you bring up is the idea of guest speakers. And it's interesting how the virtual world opens up possibilities. All of a sudden, you could call a colleague in New York or Paris uh, and say, how about doing an a interview with me during my class? And so all kinds of new options are open for bringing people virtually to a class, which of course is available other times as well. But now we have to rely on thinking through those things. And by the way, one of the really wonderful things about the student population of the dance department is that everybody is coming. Just as you say, they're coming to class, but they're also coming back. One of the big concerns that UCI had for the fall is how many students in the end would just say, you know, maybe not. I think I'll just give it a miss. And almost nobody in the dance department, this is true of the School of the Arts in general, almost nobody is saying no thanks. We have a fantastic percentage of students, well over 90, almost 95% of our students who are saying, no, what I'm getting from the dance department is absolutely worth my time. I'm going to be there ready for Molly's class, ready for Alan's class, etc. So it's a great tribute to what you've just laid out that you're doing. What are some of the things that you're doing for the fall in specific to help students get over a number of these hurdles? I mean, for example, the Marley floors, et cetera. Say, say something about the strategies that you're adopting for the fall. Right. Well, I, th I think that, you know, we, we felt like we did well in the spring, but we also realized that we have to do better in the fall. And, and that <laughs> means, you know, in enhancing our programs and, and being able to engage the students. So there's been a, a few, several things going on. Um, one, a number of our faculty um, did a d digital learning um, program over the summer, a seven week program. And I know that I took the course and I know that several of my colleagues took the course as well. So that just helps us be better at doing things remotely and online and being sensitive to the students and getting some of those techniques and tools and technology and all of that kind of stuff. Um, but I think more importantly is what, what we are really thinking about for our students. Um, we've been sort of made ourselves a list of things that we would like to, to have in terms of materials and resources to try and help our students. And one of the things that we um, talked about was the Marley floor. In, in dance studios, we have a, a plastic surface that's called Marley, well, that's sort of a generic term for it, but it's a plastic surface that is rolled out over the floor to give a consistent surface that's not slippery um, for the dancers to be working on. So all of our studios, except for one, has a Marley floor in it. So what we've done, um, there was some old Marley floor that we had in the school and we asked for the production department to cut that Marley floor into four by four foot squares so that we could offer that to our local students to pick up so that they could take it back to their dorm room or their apartment or their home and be able to lay it out in their kitchen or in their living room or wherever so that they would have that consistent surface to be dancing on for their ballet class, modern class, jazz class, hip hop class as well. 
And I think that that will be helpful for our students. So we have 143 squares of Marley that we are having our students sign up to pick up um, to be able to take back to their living and be able to lay out um, for them to be able to use for this fall quarter and maybe beyond. Um, a couple of other things that we're working on that we haven't quite gotten organized, we're still working on the funding for it, but that are, I think would be important is that I have our, um, a, a gentleman who has made all the ballet bars for our studios in, in, in the past, is doing a prototype ballet bar, which is a shorty, about four feet long, that can be taken apart so it could be put in the back of a truck or back of a vehicle, car seat, trunk of a car, can be taken apart and that we're trying to look to see about having some of those built so that our dance majors could be able to pick up a portable ballet bar as well so that they're not having to hang on to the back of a chair or onto the kitchen counter or um, the doorknob to the closet or, or whatever. So we're working on that um, and as well. We also are looking at um, skeletons for our kinesiology and injury prevention class. We have um, little miniature skeletons that are about 14 inches tall that we would like to get um, 55 of them so that our freshmen would have a skeleton to be able to work with in the class when they're doing their kinesiology and injury prevention classes with Dr. Sharp so that they can actually have something to be working with as well. And then we're also talking about little mini tripods that people could put their cameras on for our dance and video class. So that because you don't have a cameraman now, you gotta be your own cameraman and be able to dance. So we're looking at, at that kind of thing as well. So we're working on a few of these things to try and make the, um, the work of our dancers be um, more accommodated and um, to support them um, as we go into this virtual world um, into the fall as it's well. It's really wonderful because what you've done is to think through absolutely practical ways in which the little bubble, the microcosm in which the dancer is working, as you say, at home or in the dorm room or out in the driveway or the backyard or wherever she may be dancing can actually could uh, achieve a kind of consistent uh, situation with other students who are in the class. It's a, it's a wonderful equalizing opportunity. And I should take a second to say that the School of the Arts, through its Dean's Arts Board and a wonderful support organization that we've created called the Claire Trevor Society, uh, has established something called the Student Resiliency Fund. Um, what we've done is to go to each of the chairs, you, Molly, and the other three chairs, and to say, okay, we're in a crisis time. This is unlike any time we've been in before. Let's not think about 10 years down the road. Let's think about what students and instructors need right now to succeed in having the classes be as successful as they can be in this time. And the dance department's desire for the Marley floors, for the ballet bars, for skeletons, and a couple of other things has been the things that you as a department have put forward and on the uh, UCI, the Claire Trevor School of the Arts website is a full layout of what the dance department really needs and the amounts of money required to get them. Anybody who is listening and watching at the moment who wants to support the things that Molly has just laid out, please take the opportunity to go to the CTSA website. Um, you'll see under the Student Resiliency Fund opportunities for supporting a dance student with a floor uh, portion or with a bar, et cetera. Um, now's the time when stepping up and helping our students uh, is absolutely at a premium. So um, I think what you've done is just fantastic. Obviously, over the course of time, you and I and others are going to be talking about the longer term student needs, but right now we just want to make sure that the experience of students in the studio and the classroom is maximized. So that's just wonderful. It's great. And it's resulted in some really amazing events, you know, keeping in mind that the School of the Arts is at a certain level about presenting its work, its research as dancers, actors, um, artists, and musicians to the world, the dance department really was the pioneer last spring in finding ways to bring performance 
to the screen, as it were. So Molly, take a, take a minute to talk about the physical graffiti event that happened last spring. Yes. Um, well, physical graffiti is a, is a performance that we do every spring and it's uh, choreographed by our undergraduate students. And I have to say, they're probably about the most creative group I can think of right now. Um, what they did for Physical Graffiti was quite phenomenal. Um, we had co-artistic directors, Lisa Noggle, Professor Lisa Noggle, and Lindsay Gilmore. And um, they basically pivoted and put things online. So um, Lisa has experience doing telepresence and telematic kind of work. And so she's very creative about trying to use technology and be uh, online for productions. And between the two of them and then working with their fantastic stage manager from the drama department, um, Jesus Lopez, um, who had very creative ideas as well. They put together a, a performance, a performance, um, online that included a number of different pieces that were recorded and edited by the dance students themselves, put it up on a website, um, and then people could view the pieces, and then they did a live Q&A with the choreographers and Lisa and Lindsay um, that allowed the audience members to ask questions about the pieces. And so they sort of walked them through the website piece by piece and then asked questions about the different pieces. Um, and we got some fantastic work of video and uh, recorded kind of productions that the students edited. Some went into animation. Um, it was just really quite unique um, what they all put together. Um, so I, as I, as I say, I think that's, this is a generation that's grown up with technology, who's had their phones and been recording and, and putting together things like this, and they were uh, ready to go. Um, I think at first they were a little stunned by, oh my gosh, what are we doing? Um, how are we going to do this? And a lot of them were very disappointed because this this was their senior year and they wanted to do their senior thesis projects and that sort of thing. But they really um, were very resilient and, and came back in and, and did some quite unique um, production pieces, uh, dance pieces, where um, one in, in, for instance, was that they had their dancers all um, videotaped themselves dancing on grass areas and then they edited it all together so they all looked kind of like they were on the same grassy area but they really weren't um you know so putting together some of those ideas and concepts of what they were really trying to do um was was wonderful and and then there was one who did a solo called home that she did videotaped around her home and dancing through the hallway and out into the backyard and everything i mean it was just really um wonderful the work that they did so um yeah really proud of them so so we're actually taking that concept basically and going to be producing our new slate which is our graduate choreography work that we normally do in the fall quarter um, we'll be working and doing that also virtual remote and um, Lisa Noggle will be the artistic director for that. And we're actually devising sort of a technology production team that includes um, a couple of our production people like Keith Bangs and Bruce Warner, and then uh, faculty member John Crawford. And we're sort of pulling together this technology um, team to kind of help support because not everybody is as adaptable to that but this will be choreographed by graduate students. And so they'll be meeting um, during orientation week and doing auditions via Zoom uh, during <laughs> week one, auditioning dancers. And then they'll start working on their pieces that will pre be presented um, remotely, live stream, uh, video. We'll see what they create, but I'm sure it will be fantastic. Um, and then that will be created and presented at the end of the fall quarter. 
And uh, a lot of these grad students um, were taking choreography, grad choreography with Lisa and Lar Lubavitch in the spring quarter. So they have a little bit of experience starting to work with video and editing and that kind of thing as well. Um, so we're anxious to see uh, what they come up with. I, I think it will be fantastic. It's just amazing what these students are able to, to do. Well, I can attest to the, the amazing creativity of the event last spring, the physical graffiti experience, um, which actually was quite a lively experience for the viewer because we had to keep switching between various platforms. We did our own dance, pretty complicated one, to take advantage of all of the various platforms and technologies that the students had done. This was really one of the first online performance events in the area. And it was very audacious. It wasn't just, oh, gosh, let's go on Zoom and do a dance. I mean, it took advantage of all kinds of really creative, as you say, all the way from animation to um, uh, YouTube presentations, et cetera. I mean, it was, it was really remarkable, partly because the students, and obviously with the help of uh, Lisa and others, the students knew enough about the specific strengths of the various technologies that they could actually maximize what they wanted to try and do. I mean, one of the things that we're facing in the Zoom world that you and I are facing at this moment, for example, is that Zoom is just fine for a kind of talking heads interview like Arts Talk. But when you're doing a dance or when you're doing a play, you know, the sound quality is good for voice, but terrible for music. Um, the opportunities for a little rectangle of vision, not so good for the expansiveness of a dance. So the idea of beginning the experimentation with the incredible richness of what they achieved last spring was just amazing. I can't tell you how much I'm looking forward to seeing New Slate as uh, the surprises unfold through the course of the fall, it's really going to be fun to see how they develop it. That's going to extend then in all likelihood into Dance Visions, which is the faculty choreographed um, extravaganza, always one for me, one of the real high points of the year of the CTSA performance year, which will happen in, during the winter term. I assume that you're you're already in the early, early, early days of planning for what's going to happen with that. It's a very elaborate production that takes place in the winter. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we're we're already starting to talk about it. We're learning from what is being what has been done in physical graffiti and what's being discussed for New Slate. Um, and so we've had a meeting um, with a production techn technology sort of team and are working towards that. Um, that'll be following, um, we'll probably start auditioning for that um, in the early part of the quarter after we do the audition for New Slate. Um, and so we'll be, you know, learning as we go. I mean, I think basically we'll be doing two tracks. New Slate is on one track and Dance Visions will be on another track and we'll be kind of learning with each other as we go down the road. Um, and I, I expect that um, we will have some of our faculty will be restaging um, pieces that they have done before, um, maybe solos and that sort of thing. But I also expect that some of our faculty will be doing new original works um, as part of their research and creative process um, and, and discovering what they can develop in, in this new technology Zoom world um, and, and working on developing new works um, in that way as well. Um, so yeah. we'll be, um, stay tuned because we'll be working <laughs> on dance visions and, and as well for the winter quarter. And, you know, it's one of those things is we, we would love to be in person, but, you know, it, it's, it's just not feasible right now. So we, we have to just remain very open and flexible and be able to go e any direction at any time, which is, you know, when you're used to kind of doing a production a certain way, um, it makes this a, a bit of a challenging time for us. But I think that everybody will rise to the occasion and, and we'll, we will stay flexible about it. And, and we're determined to do productions though, because that's what we're about. Um, we need to get our dancers performing. We need to have them moving. We need to convey stories. We need to express 
people's feelings and emotions. Um, so w that's what we'll continue doing. And um, if the production is online, remote, then so be it. Um, that's what we have to do. And, you know, l let's be honest, that's what all the dancers are doing worldwide. You know, we're doing our Zoom classes, but so is the Paris Opera Ballet and American Ballet <laughs> Theater and, and San Francisco Ballet. Um, and, you know, some of the major companies are trying to talk about, you know, when can they go back, but they're also, you know, not able to do their regular performances as well. So, um, you know, we're, we're keeping in touch with what's going on with the dance field as a whole and um, trying to stay up to date with that and, and seeing what the possibilities are down the road. But we also have to be safe and take care of our students and our faculty and our staff as well, so. Absolutely, we're, 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 we're determined as an institution to protect our students, faculty and staff to the degree to which we can do it. And we've been very successful. And one of the really interesting things that you point out about what the dance department has done in this series of performances is to take advantage of the way in which creative research, in this case in dance, really can take advantage of even the most, the strangest and most counterintuitive uh, circumstances, like not being able to get together personally, to be incredibly creative and exciting. And these are lessons that we're going to take with us when the pandemic disappears. You know, the return to normal thing is really not a desire. We want to be better when we're out of the other end of this than we were. We're learning all kinds of things that you've just pointed out um, about how we can expand and extend the experience of a wider audience, of deeper and wider student experience into what the nature of the arts and, and dance is all about. So the dance department has just been so, so, so much ahead of the curve in doing this. It's just been wonderful for me to sit in the virtual dean's office here in my house and watch what, what you've done as, a, as a, just a creative uh, fountain. It's just been great to see. And of course, for the dance department, that's very significantly focused on developing really creative, imaginative thinking dancers, focus on the students. And one of the ways in which the dance department has done that is to create what I can tell you as the dean of all four departments here is a unique family orientation for dance students in the dance department. It's a big group but it's a group that gets along in ways that is almost unique among student cohorts on virtually any campus. And one way you've done that is through the Student Advisory Committee, which um, is self-selected, I believe, and that actually works as a, a, a liaison between dance students and faculty and staff, et cetera. So say something about the Student Advisory Committee and how it works in the dance department. Yeah, um, this commit this group is really a quite phenomenal creative group. Um, it's made up of about twelve undergraduate students representing the different um, levels. You know, the senior down to sophomore and freshman. Um, they have co-chairs um, that are usually two seniors that are working together to co-chair the the committee. They meet on a weekly basis um, to discuss any uh, concerns that are coming to them from the other students. So they're representing basically all of the undergraduate students and even graduate students if, if need be um, for any concerns. And before the pandemic, it was things like we need more hand sanitizer in the studio or you know, something like that. Now it's, it's really more about they're working hard to try and keep our dance community together and to communicate with the students and to, to listen to the students as well. Um, they've started a Slack group um, so that they have different topics that they can communicate with each other about. And then, as I mentioned, they, they meet weekly to discuss any kind of issues or concerns or questions that the students might have. And then they meet with me as the chair and Diane Diefenderfer, who is our undergraduate advisor, and we meet with them monthly. 
and we're available to meet with them in between if they like, but at least monthly we meet and they have an agenda of items that they want to discuss and we discuss um, what can be done, what are our possible options, um, what are some basic responses or solutions to some of the questions, um, and we try to work together to be able to, to, to develop um, solutions. And the whole idea is just to try to make the dance department um, more cohesive, to have communication between the students and the faculty, um, to try and make it a better environment for the students, you know, to listen to what some of their concerns are. Um, and I think that we as faculty all try to do that in our own courses as well. Um, but I think this is a, an avenue for the, the students to be able to express their concerns through the student advisory committee um, and then have it come to us as faculty and then they can take the information back to um, the rest of the students as well. Um, it's a fantastic group of volunteers. Um, it's, they actually have an application process that they go through to become a part of the, the uh, committee. Uh, and they ask uh, several questions about um, concerns that they have, what would, they, what would their solution be. So it's a bit of problem solving that um, they're looking at. And then um, trying to have representation from the different uh, years, second year, third year, fourth year students. Um, and they, they then vet the applications and then they bring them to Diane and myself. Um, and we provide input for um, what we think would be good participants in the, the committee as well. And um, then they select to replace the people that are graduating. And that usually happens during spring quarter. Um, right. So. It's a great idea. It's a, it's a, it's a fantastic example of, of student contribution to the departmental governance. And really wonderful that that voice, the voice, the concerted voice, through the committee of the students is so valued by the dance department. I'm wondering whether the interaction, the dialogue with the um, student advisory committee had anything to do with the, the new direction that the dance department has taken in its most recent hires. Um, you know, the dance department at UCI is very well known from the beginning for its commitment to ballet. Um, um, in through the Donald McHale era and now uh, with Laura and others, the, the modern uh, techniques as well um, with uh, uh, S.M.R. Ray, uh, with jazz dance and, and et cetera. But there's a whole new area that's being developed, the, the hip hop area. You know, this initially isn't something that a lot of institutions consider to be part of an academic dance department, I think very much to their loss. But once again, you and the dance department have said, no, this is something we need to do. Did student input have something to do with the decision the department made? Well, I think that it, this was something that has been um, being discussed and considered for several years, um, not just while I've been chair, but it's been something that where we felt like we really needed to be a, a really strong three-legged stool, as I mentioned earlier, you know, between ballet, modern, and jazz, and we sort of put hip hop in the jazz um, area. Um, you know, yes, we do listen to the students, and, and sometimes um, they come to us and they want more classic modern, and so we try to listen to that, and sometimes they, they want more hip hop, and so we try to listen to that. Um, so, you know, yes, we are influenced by the students, but I would say this has been a, a longer conversation in the dance department about really trying to strengthen the program. The idea that we talked about at the beginning that we have, you know, three sort of areas and our dancers need to be doing all of those to be able to be flexible, strong, adaptable dancers for the professional world. Um, and, and I think that we have, have felt that our jazz area has not had as much attention and as much um, su support in that way. And so thank you to, to you and to the higher ups for um, listening to us and, and helping us get um, the position of a, a new hip hop slash jazz person into our department. Um, 
which we were started the search on this last year. And um, we were very excited about it. And then when we got to the end and we were doing all the interviews via Zoom and, and everything, it was kind of a crazy way to be, be hiring somebody. But then we had two really, really fantastic um, candidates for the position and which allowed us to apply for the Inclusive Excellence Supplement. And so we were very, very fortunate to get two hires out of the one. And we now have um, Ariane uh, Johnson and Syrian Reed, who will be joining us this fall. Both are fantastic uh, hip hop, jazz, and tap dancers. Um, both of them have extensive experience teaching um, online as well as in person. And both have really fantastic uh, professional background in the hip hop commercial dance um, area. And it, I think this is going to be really a fantastic way to balance our program between ballet, modern jazz, hip hop, and uh, allow our students to have um, that experience as well, which is really important for them as um, developing as dancers and um, as professionals in the field. Um, so we're very excited about um, Ariane and Syrian joining us. Um, it's an interesting time to have new faculty coming on board. Um, we say to them, yes, you have an office. Here's a picture of it. Um, you know, because we can't, we, we can organize a time for them to come and move materials into their office, but you know, it's, it's gonna be Zoom for a while. Um, but Ama has done a great job of working with them on, on helping them with the curriculum and syllabus and, and all of that. Um, I've met with them several times and will be their mentors so they can come to me with any questions. Um, and so, you know, we're, we're going to do everything we can to, to welcome them and to have them join us. And, and I would say it's one of the things that we've been doing in our dance department is we've been having our faculty meetings regularly, weekly, um, because I feel it's so important for all of us as a faculty to get together and see each other, even if it's only on Zoom, so that we um, are a part of the same team to move forward and to work with our students and focus on what we can do for our students. Um, so we're tremendously grateful. Thank you, Dean Barker and the, the university for having the ability to be able to hire these two new faculty members. Um, I think it's really going to strengthen and balance out our program um, in, in some really incredible ways. And as you mentioned, this is a bit unique for a, a dance department in an academic um, setting to put so much emphasis on hip hop as well. But well, I, I'm, I'm, I'm happy to, to have been able to play a small part in working with you and the dance department to present credentials for a double hire. Um, this is a program at UCI that allows uh, a situation like this to go forward to the provost's office where, to be perfectly frank, there's a, there's a choice between finalists for a given position that a department just really doesn't want to make because uh, losing one would be such an amazing loss. And it's very rare for a successful uh, inclusive excellence hire to happen around the campus, it's very competitive. And so um, we were, of course, delighted that when the word came back that we had actually gotten the opportunity to offer positions to both of these well, I really want to say that it's been just an, an enormously positive and wonderful experience to work with you, Molly, and to share some of the truly remarkable things going on in the dance department at the moment. It's a, it's a real treasure, and I'm very, very grateful for your, your willingness to sit down with me and have a chat about the department. I look forward to seeing what the fall is going to be like with your performances and to keeping in touch with you about how the department develops over the course of this second installation of a COVID year. So thank you so much, Molly, for coming and participating. I'm very grateful. 
Thank you, Stephen. It's been nice to have this chat and to share our dance department activities with um, your audience. Um, we're excited about jumping into the fall quarter and working with our graduate students and our undergraduate students and seeing what creative things that we can develop and supporting our students as we move forward in this virtual world. So thank you very much for your support and for the support of the community as well.